Thank you for coming to our economic uh, panel. Uh, it's been a pleasure to work with the people to my left for many years. Uh, one of the things we've tried to do is uh, convey the improvement and reputation of the economics department around the university in the United States, and we have done panels like this to try to do that. So I'd like to introduce our panel for this morning's discussion. My name's uh, Chris Waller. I am a professor here at Notre Dame since 2003. I'm also on leave as the research director and senior vice president of the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. To my left is Casey Buckles, assistant, prof assistant professor of economics at Notre Dame, one of my former students as an undergrad, so there's hope for all of you. <laughs> uh, Casey mainly works on labor economics and healthcare, and she'll be talking about these various issues today. To her left is Professor Nelson Mark, the Alfred Crane Chair of Economics. Nelson and I came here together in 2003 to help build and start the new economics department here at Notre Dame. To his left is Michael Priest. Mike came here five years ago. Mike's a domer like you, and we were very fortunate to hire him away from Maryland, get him out of the Beltway, back to the heartland. Uh, Mike's specialty is uh, macro labor, and uh, so that's why he get, he'll get questions on any labor market stuff. And finally, Tim first is new to Notre, Notre Dame. He's the O'Neill Chair of Economics. He started at Northwestern, then was at Bowling Green for many, many years, and has been a consultant to the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland for 20 years. So rather than let me talk about policy, I'll let Tim talk about monetary policy. And at the end of the panel, we'll be opening everything up to Q&A from you. So we look forward to hearing what your comments as well as you listening to us. So with that, why don't we get started? The financial crisis of 2007-2008 shook the American economy to its core. While the financial sector is stabilized to some degree, the real economy continues to struggle. Real GDP appears to have suffered a permanent drop in the level and a somewhat slower growth rate in its longer run trend. In addition to that, unemployment has fallen dramatically and appears to be at a permanently lower level. The unemployment rate has hovered around 8% since 2009, something that has not happened since the Great Depression. Furthermore, labor force participation is back to the level it was in 1980. The crisis and the recession that followed led to large and innovative policy responses. First of all, the Federal Reserve poured in $1.6 trillion through a variety of channels to put out the liquidity fire in the financial correct markets, and then it took it back out. Subsequently, in response to the collapsing housing market, the Fed drove interest rates to zero, undertook massive balance sheet operations, which increased our balance sheet from a little over $800 billion to nearly $3 trillion in the last couple of years. This has sparked lots of fears and debates about impending inflation and a return to 1970s style stagflation. During that period, we had another major fiscal policy action, which was the introduction of Obamacare. Healthcare spending accounts for 18% of GDP. That's more than the Defense Department, Social Security, and Medicaid combined. As we've seen, healthcare spending has been part of the political debate this fall and will continue to be a debate about how we control spending into the future. Now, in addition to the U.S. problems and issues, the world is suffering through a sovereign debt crisis, which shows no sign of letting up and has thrown Europe into recession. So we see, appear to be seeing the start of a global slowdown with Europe in recession and China and India slowing dramatically. It's at this junction where difficult economic questions confront our nation policymakers like myself. First, have we witnessed a structural change in the U.S. labor market that will keep unemployment high for a very long time? Has skills mismatch become a more prominent problem in the U.S. than in previous recessions? Second, how will a slowdown in the emerging giants of China and India affect the U.S.? In particular, could it thrill the U.S. back into another recession? Third, how has Obamacare affected the state of health care in the U.S., and what do we expect going forward? And finally, will the Federal Reserve's moves into uncharted waters regarding interest rate policy and balance sheet expansion spur recovery or set us up for the next economic crisis? So with that, let me turn to our panel of experts and see what they think. So Mike, first, what about the labor market? Are we seeing a structural change or will it return to normal? Yeah, so when, when we talk about the labor market today, the first thing that comes to mind, of course, is jobs. Where are the jobs? 
why is the unemployment rate so high? Uh, so to think about these questions, let's, let's start by trying to get a sense of the scale of the problem. Um, often labor market statistics are reported in terms of rates, such as the unemployment rate, which today was announced it's fallen to, it's, it's risen slightly to 7.9%. Uh, I think it's sometimes instructive, though, to think not just in terms of rates, but to, to think in terms of actual numbers. So, so, let's, so let's look at the numbers. Um, today there are 12.5 million unemployed workers. Uh, that's about 6 million more than the number prior to the financial crisis in 2007. Um, but those 6 million additional unemployed workers are only part of the story. Uh, many people got discouraged and left the labor force altogether, uh, causing the labor force to shrink by about 8 million relative to what it would have been if there had been no recession. Putting those two numbers together, uh, the number of, of employed people has shrunk by about 14 million people relative to what it would have been if we hadn't had this recession. Uh, so that's a lot of people, of course. Uh, and if we assume, as, 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 as seems natural, that those people are people who still want to work, then that's a lot of wasted talent, a lot of wasted opportunity. So let's think for a minute about, about the standard policy prescription when we face a recession that causes this type of waste in the labor market. Um, the standard analysis says that policymakers can encourage firms to start hiring again by increasing demand for those firms' goods. Uh, the main tool for increasing that demand is, is monetary policy. Uh, the Fed increases the money supply, lowers interest rates in order to make it easier for households and firms to buy on credit. <laughs> Sometimes the government also tries fiscal policies, either tax cuts or increases in government spending. Since the uh, crisis erupted in 2008, we've tried both. Uh, and we've tried both on a, on a really huge scale. Uh, the fiscal stimulus package was nearly a trillion dollars. It was about $800 billion. And as Chris alluded to, monetary policy has been unprecedented, really, in both its scope and its scale. Um, now, in spite of this aggressive policy response, here we are, four years after the financial crisis <coughs> erupted, and the labor market is still really, really weak. It's, it's really in shambles. Uh, the, re the recovery has been anemic at best. Uh, and that forces us as economists to try to understand why things are so different this time. Uh, if the standard prescription hasn't worked, then is the diagnosis wrong? Is it perhaps not the case that uh, this is, that, is it perhaps not the case that this is just a matter of insufficient demand? Uh, and if not, what are the possibilities? What are some of the possible explanations for what, for what we're seeing in the labor market? Now I'll discuss briefly two possibilities. One possibility is that the labor market is suffering from an increase in what we call mismatch. Uh, so, so what do we mean by that? Um, you know, th there are industries and geographic regions of the country that are doing well. Um, firms face plenty of demand and they'd like to hire more workers, but the unemployed workers don't have the skills appropriate for those types of jobs, or the unemployed workers aren't located in the same regions where the firms that are expanding. Uh, now, when this sort of mismatch occurs, the adjustment in the labor market uh, tends to be much slower than, than, than it otherwise would be. Uh, and really, this adjustment can only occur if the unemployed either move to where the firms are expanding or if the unemployed acquire the skills that are needed by the firms that are searching for workers. The second possibility for explaining what's so different about the labor market this time is that firms are exercising a lot of restraint in hiring. Uh, because of the amount of economic uncertainty out there. Uh, and no doubt there's a lot of uncertainty out there. There's uncertainty regarding what will happen with the European sovereign debt situation. Uh, there's uncertainty, as Nelson's going to talk about in a moment, about whether China's economy will experience a hard landing, uh, because there is evidence that their economy is slowing down. And there's also considerable uncertainty about a lot of domestic policies, such as future tax rates. Uh, and, and taken together, what all these different types of uncertainty suggest is that there's, there's, there's some chance out there that we're going to return to recession and we're going to have some really bad outcomes. Uh, and in the face of all this uncertainty, firms uh, may choose to hold off on expanding their hiring, ex on, on expanding their production, uh, because why, well, why would firms do that? Well, because it's, it's, it's costly to hire workers and then costly to have to fire them again. 
And so if they're uncertain whether they're really going to need these workers in the long run, they may just hold off on hiring them in the first place until the economic certainty is resolved. And so many economists are, are studying these, these, these two hypotheses uh, in order to discern whether mismatch or increased level of uncertainty are the root of, of the labor market's current weak recovery. Um, and from a policy perspective, it's, it's really important to, to, to answer these questions because further fiscal stimulus or further monetary stimulus are not likely to cause a strong rebound in the labor market. Uh, if the root causes of the weak economy uh, or the weak recovery are labor market mismatch and economic uncertainty. Instead, uh, further fiscal policy or monetary policy uh, would run the risk of, of causing rising inflation inflation, and, and spiraling government deficit um, if, if, again, the, uh, the, the source of the problem in the labor market is economic uncertainty and, uh, and mismatch. Um, so with that in mind, I guess I'll stop and let my fellow panelists discuss their topic. Well, I know this is one of the issues that we're concerned about at the Fed is that unemployment is still high and we could be tossed into another recession. So one of the debates we often have is, is China now a global engine of growth? And if that engine slows down, will it drag the rest of us down? I mean, China is the second largest economy in the world. Nelson, what's your thoughts? Well, that's right. Um, being the second largest economy, it's uh, uh, no doubt important to the United States. Uh, no, normally, when we talk about China, or when you hear about China, the 90% of the uh, media exposure is about cheap imports to the U.S. and exporting jobs from the U.S. and China, which is part of it, but it's really not the whole story. So let me uh, kind of uh, walk you through some of the things that uh, we don't hear about. Um, so first, uh, China is our second biggest export market. Uh, only, we only export more to Canada. Um, since 2001, when China uh, ascended, uh, joined the uh, World Trade Organization, U.S. exports to China have been growing 17 percent a year. Um, so uh, that, that's, there, there's a huge growth market there. Um, the United States has a comparative advantage in, in services and in producing capital goods. Um, both of which are, um, are important to China and uh, is, is a market that we can exploit as we go forward. China is still a very capital, capital poor country, so they have uh, a lot of capitalization still to go. Um, and finally, the, um, the Chinese government has been encouraging uh, Chinese foreign direct investment as a way to diversify away from the huge amounts of treasury paper that they're holding. Um, and, uh, you know, even in the U.S., foreign, foreign owned firms uh, account for something like 17 percent of manufacturing employment. So as we go forward, I think, you know, this is, this is an uh, a, uh, opportunity that the U.S. should try to, try to be exploiting. Now, um, in terms of the risks, from China's perspective, there's three. Uh, there's the risk of a, a, global, sh uh, a global slowdown. Uh, there's an inflation risk internally in the country, and there's a risk to the real estate market. So in terms of um, the global slowdown, uh, exports are, are very important to China's economy. It accounts for about 26 percent of the GDP. Um, and Europe and the U.S. are their two biggest markets. So a slowdown in Europe, a slowdown in the U.S. Uh, could potentially uh, is, is, is a source of concern. Um, now, uh, people, critics, people like Rubini, who's the Dr. Dr. Doom in economics, uh, predicted a hard landing for China when um, the slowdown occur, uh, be began. Now, it's a little context here. For the last 25 years or so, uh, the Chinese economy has grown at more than 10 percent a year. Um, and, but uh, the earlier concerns about a hard landing, I think, uh, probably um, are not kind of going to come to pass. It looks like uh, China's economy has slowed down, but we're looking at something like seven and a half to eight percent growth this year. 
Uh, so it's more of a soft landing for them, although if we had 75 or 8% growth in the U.S., uh, that would uh, hardly be a, a soft landing. It would be something, something uh, very different. Um, in terms of their inflation, uh, it appears that um, uh, that, that is moderated. Inflation has been about 3% this year, uh, partly because of uh, moderation in commodity prices. Um, and thirdly, you know, there, there has been a problem with the real estate bubble in China. Uh, there's been, there's sort of a lack of investment opportunities for people, um, and real estate is one of the areas that uh, people with money can, can invest, and so you have people uh, buying two, three, four, five apartments um, as an as investment uh, vehicle. Um, the recently, um, the government has imposed <coughs> restrictions on that kind of speculative investing and uh, real estate uh, prices have stopped rising. Now the problem with real estate is that you, know, you have an inflation in real estate prices, then you have a deflation, and then it creates the same kinds of problems that we saw uh, with um, the uh, MBS crisis in the U.S. and, and banking crisis in, 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 uh, in uh, Europe. So um, that, that seems to be moderating. So in, in the short term, uh, sort of the, um, the short term problems seem to be um, uh, moderating. Um, there are long term problems in China. Um, I, maybe uh, in the interest of time, I won't get into too many of those, but one of the uh, uh, policy uh, shifts that uh, is uh, being implemented now may have actually implications for the United States. So the new five-year plan calls for a shift of um, the industry away from investment towards uh, services, um, and the idea is to raise consumption um, and to reduce the reliance on investment as the engine of growth. Um, for years, investment in China has amounted to more than 50% of GDP. It's been the primary driver of, of Chinese growth with exports second. Um, so shifting the industrial structure towards services, the idea is to raise consumption. Um, now, the, when the, the concern is that as you raise consumption, savings has to go down. And uh, with a lower pool of savings, uh, interest rates, that might drive interest rates up. There's a global work market for, for savings. And as interest rates um, uh, get pushed up, it may make it more difficult for the Fed to keep interest rates low. As you uh, probably know, Bernanke has, uh, uh, has, has uh, sort of gone on record saying that we're going to keep interest rates at zero for, a, for the foreseeable future. So that's possibly a, a flashpoint uh, coming in the, in the future. So I'll just leave it at that. Okay. So we've got an election coming up on Tuesday, and there's uh, been a lot of discussion of health care. You have Obama and the Democrats viewing Obamacare as the signature accomplishment of his administration, and the Republicans viewing it as the signature catastrophe of his <laughs> administration. And so we have, hear a lot of political rhetoric and accusations back and forth, but it would be useful to know. Casey, give us a straight scoop. What's the impact I'll, of Obamacare? I'll do my best, but it's a tall order. Um, yeah, but I think, you know, if you're someone who is voting based on health care policy or in part on health care policy, then it really does come down to how you feel about this one policy, uh, the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare, as both campaigns now refer to it. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about two key problems in the health care market in the U.S. before 2010 when the act was passed, and then talk about how the uh, Affordable Care Act tries to address those problems. Um, so the first big issue is access to health care insurance. So in 2010, there were 50 million uninsured Americans. That's about 16% of our population. And I think there are some misconceptions about who the uninsured were pre-Obamacare. So it was not, for example, the very poor in the U.S. Uh, the very poor are already covered by programs like Medicaid and the state children's health insurance program. Rather, the uninsured are largely the self-employed or people who work for small firms who can't afford insurance on the individual or small group markets. So, in fact, two-thirds of the uninsured uh, non-elderly population in 2007 were full-time, full-year workers. So it's people like your barber or the staff at your child's uh, small daycare center. So that's access. Uh, the other big issue was uh, the cost of health care. 
So uh, as Chris mentioned in his introduction, 18% uh, of US GDP goes towards health care. That's $2.6 trillion in 2010, or $8,402 per capita. That per capita level is more than double most other OECD countries. And the federal government spends about a quarter of its budget on health care, mostly for Medicare and Medicaid. So that's the level of health care spending, already very high. And then the costs are only going up. So from 1999 to 2010, while the general price level increased about 31%, health insurance premiums went up 138%. So there are a couple of, a lot of reasons, uh, a couple I'll mention for this big increase in costs. One is just that uh, the U.S. population is only getting older, and older people use more care. Uh, so that's working against us. Um, but the other is that there have been some really, there continue to be really remarkable uh, advances in medical technology, uh, and those advances get us some really fantastic results in terms of health, but also are just very expensive. Um, so as one example, there's the cholesterol-reducing drug Lipitor. That's a statin drug. It was approved in 1996. Ten years later, in 2005, we were spending $16 billion on statin drugs, and 25% of adults over 45 were on a statin drug, right? So we go from zero to $16 billion in 10 years. That's a huge increase in cost. Um, but at the same time, Lipitor has reduced mortality for those early users by 12%. So that's a huge effect on health. There's sort of no more important health outcome than dead or not, right? <laughs> so uh, I think a lot of the people that are now alive because of Lipitor would tell you that it's been worth it for them. And there are tons of other examples from uh, drugs and medical innovations that I could give. So, you know, I mentioned this to say that I think the conversation about health care costs doesn't mean much unless you talk about the benefit side of that as well. Um, so the question isn't really are the costs too high, but rather what are we getting for our money um, and how much care are we willing to pay for it? <coughs> Now there is one caveat here in terms of, uh, you know, to my discussion about the wonders of medical technology, and that brings us back to access, which is that you know, these benefits of medical innovation have not been shared by everyone in the U.S. population. Um, the socioeconomic status to care gradient is steeper in the U.S. than it is in most other developed countries. All right, so we have access and cost. How does Obamacare try to address these two issues? Um, so first, on the access side, the main thing that Obamacare tries to do is fill in the gaps in insurance coverage uh, that our employer-provided system uh, has in it. So there are several ways it does this. The most well-known are the individual insurance mandate, which is accompanied by um, tax credits for people on the individual market. It also expands Medicaid so that people who were previously earning too much to be eligible uh, but were close to being eligible uh, can now qualify. And then the law prevents people from being disqualified for pre-existing conditions. So these changes and the others are projected to actually decrease the number of uninsured Americans by 32 million by 2019, or a 60% drop in the uninsured rate. Right? Now, on the cost side, I think things are a lot less clear. So my own assessment based on um, a study from the Congre Congressional Budget Office and some others is that it's actually uh, Obamacare is unlikely to have a big effect either way fiscally. Um, so I think it's unlikely that it's going to add trillions to the deficit as Romney has claimed, but it also doesn't solve these big cost issues that I mentioned before. Um, so I think there are still some really big unresolved questions about uh, what health care costs are likely to be in the future and more importantly how we're going to pay for them. Very good. Wow, now I know how to vote. <laughs> And last but not least, I'm going to turn to Tim and ask him about something very near and dear to my heart, which is Federal Reserve policy. Thank you, sir. So I talked to the chairman just two days ago and the vice chairman yesterday, and they gave a very spirited defense of the Fed's policies and the willingness to expand the balance sheet indefinitely until unemployment gets down. What do you think? Are we in trouble from doing this, or is this going to save us? Well, well I spoke to my wife. Um, this morning. Name <laughs> <laughs> <Shame> dropper. <laughs> uh, so so I, I thought Chris did a very nice job in his intro of talking about monetary policy sort of two prongs. One is crisis response, so we want to think like fall 2008, maybe into spring 2009. But of course that was four years ago. Um, so then there's policy since then. And as Chris said, most of the stuff that happened in the fall of 2008 has all been undone. 
right? So do we talk a little bit about that? Uh, I'm sort of skeptical, I guess, to be quite honest, of the subsequent policy. But I should start out by saying that I think um, uh, the policy actions in uh, the fall of 2008 were remarkable. And I think history will judge the Bernanke Fed as being, um, being the right group of people uh, at the crisis at the right time. Um, I, I've got a great quote. There's the, the classic uh, person who's talked about, I guess historically, is a classic book called Lombard Street, written by Walter Baggett, that sort of describes uh, historically how different central banks have responded to crises. So this is a quote from, uh, this is early 19th century, I think it's like 1817 when this crisis happened. So this is the Bank of England speaking. So what do you do in a crisis? What is, should a bank do in a crisis? It says, we loan by every possible means and in modes we had never adopted before. We took stock in security, we purchased exchequer bills, we made advances on exchequer bills. We not only discounted outright, but we made advances on the deposits of bills of exchange to an immense amount. In short, by every possible means that are consistent with the safety of the bank. Now, when I read that quote, and this quote is 200 years old, and if you look at the alphabet soup list of policies that the Bernanke Fed implemented in fall of 2000, even actually before the fall of 2008, so starting um, uh, even in 2007 through the spring of 2009, it sounds a lot like this. So provide liquidity. That's what central banks are designed to do. So I think it actually very, very high scores. Historically, I think it will be seen as a, uh, as a great hero uh, of this. But as I said, that was four years ago. So where are we now? Um, it's hard to call this crisis anymore, right? You can't use crisis. You can't keep calling something a crisis, right? It gets old pretty fast, right? So the, if you look in the definition of a crisis, a crisis is a fairly short-term thing, but this is some um, four years ago. So I want to think about what they've done since then. As uh, a couple of other speakers have mentioned, so there's two policy, main policy um, uh, prongs. One is forward guidance. This is very unusual, actually, not only announcing current policy, but anticipations going forward. This is a very novel thing historically, actually, right? So, uh, so we now had, originally the announcement, I think, was something that would keep rates at zero through 2013. Now we're at 2015. Now think about 2015. We'll be through another electoral cycle at that point. We'll have a new House of Representatives pass this one. Right? This is sometime in the future. In fact, one more year will be in another presidential election. So this is long forward guidance. Secondly, and this is the other thing Chris mentioned, is this remarkable what people call quantitative easing, or I guess there's other things one could call it, but I guess that's the phrase that people use the most often. So this huge expansion in the balance sheet. Again, do not confuse this with crisis response. It's very different. The crisis response is sort of all over. So I'm sort of skeptical, I guess, a little bit about both of these. And here's the primary reason. I am a macro theorist. And so the models I work with, and in fact the models that I think are sort of got some seal of approval in the profession, all have one common, um, one common component to them. And that's that the path of inflation is a big deal. So in some sense, the central bank ultimately what it has to announce is a path for inflation. Right? Then, and then different paths for inflation have different real effects. Right? So that's ultimately the, the card. <laughs> right? That is the card they can play. Right? Well, what's peculiar about all these things, the zero, the zero interest rate policy, the quantitative easing, they're always accompanied with a statement, and we won't allow the inflation path to move from 2%. Now, I don't know how to think about this then. Because right? every model I look at says, well, if you, hold, if you take that card off the table, then all the other cards are sort of largely, they're sort of largely irrelevant. Right? You know, maybe there's a little quibble here, quibble there. So it's curious. Now, I'm not suggesting they should pull that. I'm not, I'm not saying they should, I'm advocating that, but it's, I think it's a little disingenuous. A good metaphor I use is it's like the fireman say he's going to put out the fire, but no one will get wet. That's just outside my experience of how firemen work, right? They use water, right? Seems peculiar. How about the quantitative easing on top of this? Um, I don't know if it, the evidence is mixed, but I think a fairly reasonable reading of the evidence would be that the, these asset purchases have had very modest effects on long-term rates, um, relatively modest effects. And so if you grant that, plus I think you've got to grant some sort of diminishing returns to any sort of policy intervention like that, I'm very skeptical that this extra $40 billion a month is particularly helpful. Now, of course, you know, it may not help, but you know, there always is, is, well, if it doesn't hurt, why not try it, right? This is the old saying, don't just um, stand there and do something. I always think the opposite is true. Don't just do something, 
stand there. <laughs> right? But anyway, they're going to do something. So again, I'm a little nervous about this because we don't have a good theory about how this would work. Right? And I think there are downside problems. And so let me talk a little bit about downside problems. At some point, this must come to an end, right? Everyone agrees we will exit eventually. It is not normal for rates of interest to be zero. It is not normal for the central bank to have a balance sheet of $3 trillion. That is not normal. So at some point, you've got to undo these things. So there are two issues, I think, and these are political, but I think politics is relevant here because these have huge budgetary consequences. Well, uh, one issue first. When they exit, the FOMC has signaled that when they exit, the first thing they will do is raise the funds rate. Okay, now it's not obvious you needed to proceed that way. First, you could sell off the balance sheet and then raise the, you know, I mean, it's not clear which is the obvious way to go. In fact, many would argue to go the other way around. But given you're going to raise the funds rate first, then the central bank needs to do something to prevent banks from quickly dumping their excess reserves, because that would be highly inflationary. The reserves become deposits, it becomes money. That can be problematic. So the central bank's plan is to pay interest on reserves or have other means to have banks keep those reserves by paying them to keep them. Now, I would suggest to you this is going to be politically very difficult. All right, think about the size of the Federal Reserve balance sheet. Suppose rates go from zero eventually to four and a half. Now, I jump all the way to four and a half. They won't go that quickly. But imagine we go from zero to four and a half. That's about $90 billion interest on reserves. Now, I'm not saying it's not possible for the Fed to do that. The Fed can do anything it wants. It can create this, these. It's not a revenue problem. It's a political problem. Imagine Ron Paul or his son. What is his son's name? He has a son. Mr. Yeah. Paul. <laughs> uh, imagine him before the Congress saying the Federal Reserve is paying $90 billion to banks. That is an enormous chunk of change. I think politically that becomes very difficult. Now, there's another difficulty. The biggest borrower in this country is the Treasury of the United States of America. And the Treasury of the United States of America has a huge credit card that it's essentially paying zero on. Yes? So suppose, again, we go from zero to 450 basis points. We go from zero to four and a half. Interest on the debt will be the number one budget item in the federal budget on the order of seven to eight hundred billion dollars. That's astonishing. Imagine a conversation when a Federal Reserve Chairman steps in to see the President and the Treasury Secretary and says, oh, by the way, I'm going to make interest expense the single largest budget item. That is a very difficult conversation to make. If you look at back at history, these conversations never go well. They never go well. So a great example, and I'll read another quote. This is from 1951, spring of 1951. United States, for those who are familiar with a little bit of history, this is the, the middle of very dark times in the Korean War. All right, so very dark times in the Korean War. And so the, uh, we have Treasury-Fed conflict. The Fed wanted to start raising rates because they saw inflation coming. They had been keeping rates very low. Does this sound familiar? They had been keeping rates very, very low because they were concerned about the economy. They saw inflation coming, so they wanted to start raising rates. Of course, the person who doesn't want them to raise rates is the United States Treasury and the Congress. So here's words from the congressional record and live testimony before the U.S. Congress where this congressman just grills the chairman. You know what he says? Who is master here, the Federal Reserve or the Treasury? Imagine someone saying that to Ben Bernanke. Who is master? It's not all that ridiculous, is it? Not that long ago we heard a presidential candidate saying we should hang him. Who is master here, the Federal Reserve or the Treasury? You know the Treasury came here first. Will the Federal Reserve support the Secretary of the Treasury in its effort to keep rates low, or will you sabotage the Treasury? Imagine a president looking at a chairman, chairwoman, and saying, you are sabotaging the U.S. economy. How can you do this? I think that's a very difficult conversation to have. Now, if you look at inflation forecasts, the markets don't seem to think that would happen. But I would also tell you no one thought March or fall of 2008 would happen either. Right? No one anticipated that either. Right? Great inflations are hardly anticipated. If you look at data from the 1960s, no one anticipated the great inflation we subsequently saw. No one anticipated that. But there we go. So I end with a little bit of humor. And you can laugh or giggle or sort of <laughs> make some sort of Thing like that. So imagine a couple years from now, so it's January 2017, we just inaugurated a new president. So Ben Bernanke is running a Motel 6 in Raleigh, North Carolina. 
That was a little fun. <laughs> <laughs> they keep the lights on for you for an extended period of time. <laughs> <laughs> Mitts Romney's hair has been named a UNESCO World Heritage Site, <laughs> and the Fighting Irish have just won another national championship, defeating the University of Alabama. <laughs> they have a football team, is my understanding. <laughs> so imagine the incoming president meets with the Federal Reserve Chairman, and this, you can see this is a very awkward conversation. The Federal Reserve must raise rates to prevent an ins uh, coming inflation. The president does not want to see the interest expense become the single largest <laughs> item in the budget. I mean, think about that. <laughs> That's an astonishing statement. So you all are younger than me. This will happen more on your watch than mine. Good luck to you. <laughs> All right, very good. Well, there's a lot of food for thought, a lot of intriguing comments, and some uh, frightening moments. Tim, thanks. Uh, so why don't we open it up to the audience for Q&A. Fire away. Hi, my name is Mike. Um, my question is, if the 10-year bond rate is at 1.7% right now, expected inflation is at 2%, that means the government can borrow at negative real interest rates. So why doesn't the go government just borrow infinite dollars right now? You're the interest rate guy. <laughs> well, I, I don't know. I, I, I'll first start off by saying how astonishing those numbers are. Right? In fact, if you look at uh, Treasury protected inflation, you know, the tips, the tips market, uh, tre uh, those are all, are all negative real rates. It's astonishing. <laughs> that, that's horrific. If I somehow, somehow think that real rates of interest are linked to future marginal returns on capital, that's actually a very frightening thought, right? Now you wonder, why does the Treasury go deep in debt? Well, I would suggest to you they are, um, right? Now why not buy, borrow infinite? I don't know. That, that, this, I, I think that's a, you know, a couple, you know, a trillion dollars is a substantial way towards infinity, <laughs> <laughs> right? Well, it's still the case, even with a negative real interest rate, the optimal amount of borrowing is not infinite, right? There's an Euler equation that has to be satisfied, and so it's, uh, there's, some, there's an optimal amount. Maybe the government's borrowing the optimal amount. Well, there's also the question of what, what, would, the, what would the government do with that money if it, if it borrowed it? Um, you know, I, I suppose if, if you wanted to advocate for another big fiscal stimulus where they were to go out and have a big increase in government spending, they could borrow at those negative real interest rates to finance that. Um, but I guess the case would have to be made that that's the policy that's needed, is a big, another big increase in, in government spending. And I don't think anyone's really making that right now. Because, I mean, part of the problem is at some point, whatever you borrow now has to be paid back in the future. Okay, and that's, that's one of the issues that hasn't really come up in the discussion is, is an, another big issue out there facing the economy right now is the the fiscal situation, right? The, the debt to GDP ratio has grown and it's grown rapidly um, and hasn't quite reached the level that it has reached in countries like Greece or Spain, but it's not so far from where those countries are. Um, and we see what, what happens when the debt to GDP ratios in those countries reaches a certain level, right? The, the economy kind of starts to unravel. Investors start to get nervous and they no longer want to lend. Uh, so even though it's negative now, those rates could jump really rapidly if, if, if the debt to GDP ratio were to climb too high. Or one thing you could think about, which is <coughs> when you have potentially record low interest rates on long-term debt, one thing you should definitely be thinking about doing is getting out of short-term debt, rolling it all over to long-term debt, and locking in those low rates for 30 years. In fact, some of my staff has argued we should go back to console bonds, which never mature issue them forever at some rate and that'll be it. So, and then you never have to worry about, in some sense, paying off because you never promised to rather than the interest claim on it. Uh, but, and we're starting to see the Treasury doing that. And while it's optimal for the Treasury to do that, that kind of counter is counterproductive to what the Fed's been trying to do, which is QE, buying long-term assets to try to suppress interest rates on those assets. So with the one hand, the Fed's trying to push down the interest rates. And on the other hand, the Treasury's <coughs> going, God, we should be going long into our portfolio. And so these are counterbalancing effects that in some sense is off. It's smart for the Treasury, but it's kind of counter uh, defeating what the Fed's trying to do with QE. Another question. This is uh, probably a question for Professor Mark, but uh, one of the things we've seen in China is rising labor costs um, and also 
um, higher transportation costs. So it's uh, in some ways less attractive to hire labor in China for U.S. firms. Do you think that at some point U.S. labor will become more competitive with Chinese labor? Yeah, that's a very good question, um, and that is, is something that uh, that we've observed, and it's sort of the natural progression as an economy uh, industrializes. Uh, so um, that I, I um, that is a source of concern in China about their uh, their competitiveness and their cost structure. So I do think that um, uh, as we go forward, you will see some manufacturing. Uh, move away from China towards other low-cost uh, areas in Southeast Asia and, and India. Yeah, I mean, we're already seeing, it's called onsourcing, we're already seeing American firms starting to bring back plants. In my St. Louis Fed district, we've had two cases of it where plants were closed down, one in Mexico, one in China, and they just brought it back to Kentucky and uh, Mississippi. So it's to the point where the wages are equalizing now that you can avoid transportation costs, uncertainty, and other things by just bringing it back on shore. So as markets adjust and wages adjust and China grows, you're going to see just this. Now, at some point, we start, you know, if you bring a manufacturing back to the U.S., it means you're kind of a low-cost producer in terms of manufacturing. Some people would say that's not always such a good thing for wages of lower-skilled manufacturing, but you trade off wages versus having jobs, so I guess that's the issue. I don't know if it's okay, I'll ask a follow-up question. How do you think that impacts you know, issues like skills mismatch uh, for the U.S. labor force? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, it, it was interesting in, in Nelson's response. He said, you know, if, if labor costs rise in China, uh, that may f cause some firms to, uh, to, to move into other Southeast Asian countries. Now, Chris said some of them are moving back to the U.S., um, but my guess is that what will happen primarily is that con they'll continue to try to find cheap labor elsewhere in the world. Um, and so what that suggests is that it's, you know, this idea that uh, there will be a big renaissance in American manufacturing, my guess is that it's probably not going to happen, right? And so those people who have lost jobs in, in manufacturing or, uh, you know, some of the other sectors that have been adversely hit, it's not clear that those jobs will come back. Uh, I think what's interesting about the current recession is it's, it's not really just manufacturing that's taken a hit. Manufacturing always takes a hit in recessions. Since 1980, every recession, manufacturing really falls off a cliff, manufacturing employment. Um, in this most recent recession, it's, it's been largely construction also. Um, and, and that I don't see as being so much affected by what's going on in China or in India. Um, so maybe there will be a recovery in construction, and we won't need to worry about having those workers who have construction skills uh, kind of retrain themselves for other industries. Question? All right, um, this is also a question related <coughs> to China. So in recent presidential debate, uh, candidate Mitt Romney has fired up on China for uh, manipulating uh, the exchange rate. So do you think that the trade deficit that U.S. Has, has been experiencing with China is due to the low exchange rate of Chinese currency? That's a very good question. Um, let me first of all say that I personally have a big problem with the terminology of being a currency manipulator. Um, so uh, when you talk about manipulation, you, manipulation means that you're moving something around, right? Now, the fact is that China has maintained uh, what's been a fixed exchange rate with the United States. It hasn't moved around. They've kept it fixed. And in a lot of uh, economics, we say that we, you know, we, what we like is we like stability. We don't like volatility. So if you're going to fix the exchange rate, you've removed exchange rate volatility and exchange rate uncertainty from the equation. Now. Um, the, the fact is that uh, China, when they initially uh, fixed the exchange rate, it's around uh, in the neighborhood of like 7 RMB <coughs> per dollar, um, that uh, they did do it at a rate that um, uh, um, had the uh, Chinese currency, if you will, undervalued. Okay, so uh, that did uh, make uh, Chinese goods quite cheap to, um, to Americans.
But the thing is that you know what what's important is not just the nominal exchange rate, but it's the real exchange rate. It's, 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 it's not how many dollars that it takes for the U.S. to buy an RMB, but it's how many U.S. goods it takes for us to sell to buy one Chinese good. And so that real exchange rate, as um, for every infl every point of inflation uh, in China in excess of the U.S., you're seeing that that the real exchange rate in China is is going up. And so over time, that, uh, that initial undervaluation has been dissipating. So it's really not an issue. It's, I, I, I don't believe that the, the exchange rate is uh, the primary source of the imbalance, the trade imbalance between the U.S. and China. The, the primary problem is that in the U.S. we don't save enough. Um, the current account is national savings, and because uh, the U.S. doesn't save enough, uh, that that's the primary problem of, of the trade imbalance. Other questions? Um, my name is Ro Ching. Uh, I have a question about uh, recently I read some ar article arguing that the biggest failure of the Mr. President in his first term is failing to keep the budget um, sustainable. I was wondering if you think this is a very fair comment. Uh, what do you think? from the econ perspective, is the biggest failure of Mr. President in his first term. I'm not allowed to comment on that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take a stab at that. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, actually, I don't, I don't want to assess what might be the biggest failure or biggest success of, of, of the current president. But I, I would like to kind of address the question of, you know, has the, the, the deficits that we've been running, are they a significant problem? Um, you know, I think any president who came into the current situation was almost certain to run some sort of deficit, right? He came into office, we were already running a deficit of four, five hundred billion dollars a year. Uh, and when you have a big recession, tax revenues are going to fall, and the deficit is, is naturally going to rise. Um, so from my perspective, running a pretty significant deficit in the short run in response to a recession is, is, is natural policy. For me, the bigger problem is kind of what's the trajectory that we're on. Um, and I, the biggest problem I see with kind of where the current budget is at is historically we've spent, the federal government has spent about 20 or 21 percent of GDP. Right. Okay. And we're currently at 23 percent. And with increases in Medicare spending that are projected and increases in spending on Social Security as the baby boom ages, that number is only going to rise. Okay? And so we're facing a long run trajectory in which the federal government is, is spending a much bigger chunk of our income than it has historically. And we're going to need to find a way to deal with that. We're either going to need to find new tax revenues so that we don't have to keep borrowing to make up the difference, or we're going to have to cut that spending. In, in and that's going to mean some really hard choices. Um, and politicians don't like to make those choices. They don't like to cut spending and they, they, they don't like to raise taxes. Um, but at the end of the day, that's what's going to have to happen at some point. And maybe we'll see. Once we, once we get a new president, maybe they'll, they'll feel that they have enough cushion until the next election to, to, to take some hard choices to, to resolve that question. Um, so I think I ducked your question, but, but <laughs> I, I think I at least partly addressed, addressed what you were getting at. You can link this a little bit to something that uh, Mike mentioned before at the outset of his comments. So the, the trajectory is not sustainable, right? So one thing you can be sure of is something is not sustainable, it's going to stop, <laughs> right? So everyone knows it's going to stop, right? In the sense of something needs to change dramatically. But see, since no one, since there's no clear plan on the table, there's incredible uncertainty. Right? So this is back to the comment Mike made at the beginning. Is it this policy uncertainty that drives firms' unwillingness to hire? You know, again, it's hard to assess these things, but you, you can imagine how, you know, are there going to be draconian tax increases? Are there going to be, you know what I mean? What, 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 something must change, for sure, right? And it can't be a little change. So, and if there's no clear path, then in fact, I don't think, I think a reasonable view of these last months of the election, I don't think I have a clear path for either candidate. Right, or exactly what their trajectory is. There's a great deal of uncertainty that I don't think is going to be resolved Wednesday morning. Right, there's still a great deal of uncertainty out there. Um, I don't know. I, uh, 
I hate to say things like this, sort of not sort of like name dropping again. But uh, when we were in uh, Chicago, uh, uh, talking with some uh, alums, there are some actually Notre Dame alums who have quite a bit of contacts in the uh, uh, the congressional community, and actually they made me very optimistic that there's a lot of talking going on across parties. Uh, about what we're going to do, no matter who, whichever goofball wins this election, um, <laughs> right? What the Congress is going to do going forward into November, December, January. So, but, but these are tough decisions. It's not li a little thing. I mean, this is an enormous problem. It's not a li little problems are easy, right? This is a huge problem. So, right. and I'll add. Maybe it's an obvious point, but I don't think it would be fair to characterize whatever happened with the economy as a tremendous success of solely the president. Uh, or a failure of the president. I mean, you know, it's Congress that sets the budget, and th that makes the problem a lot more politically intractable, I think, and that's part of what we've seen over the last few years. All right. Well, let me just say that I guess we're out of time, so we'll have to stop there. I appreciate your attendance and all your questions. I'd like to thank the panelists as well. Very good job, and take care.